You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring you in-depth expertise on international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm your host, Michael McFall, the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute. Today, I have a very special guest, Serhii Lashenko. He's actually not at Stanford today. He's in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, but Serhii is an alumnus of our Draper Hill Summer Fellows Program at FSI's Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. Uh, he, was a co he was part of the 213 cohort. He's also been a journalist at Ukrainska Pravda. He's been a member of parliament, and he currently serves as an advisor to President Zelensky's chief of staff, as well as a member of the Ukrainian Railways Supervisory Board. He's lived and worked in Kiev throughout the war. Uh, we, Sergei, have been in touch a lot during the war. I deeply appreciate all the conversations we've had. Uh, and we are going to be releasing this episode on February 24th, a very tragic day, uh, horrible day, uh, the one-year milestone of Putin's horrific, barbaric invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but to do so, we want to reflect on what has happened so far and where we think uh, the war is going. And Sergei, we're very delighted to have you on World Class today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, though have this project to be part of the group on sanctions together with the Ukrainian officer president. And thank you for everything has been done uh, for Ukraine by uh, you, have been done for Ukraine by you. And uh, like a year ago, we started to exchange the messages uh, extremely often. And now we, we see that our cooperation has very visible impact. So thank you for joining the process and being one of the most of the vocal advocates of Ukraine in the world. Thank you very much. and. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I appreciate those kind words. I don't know if they're deserved, but thank you. Let's just start with a, to set the tone. Tell, tell our listeners and our viewers, what's the mood right now in Ukraine? And what's the mood in the capital? You travel a lot, I see, on social media. Uh, you've been to different parts. I remember you taking a train to Kherson, right at the very beginning of the liberation of Kherson. What, how would you describe the mood in general uh, as, as your country now has endured one year of this invasion from Russia? I can say directly that it's complicated, you know. I would like to say that you know, everyone is, you know, excited and uh, like very supportive for Ukraine, but at the same time, we have to be fair and saying that people exhausted, or soldiers yes. super tired, super exhausted. Our army needs ammo. It's really what president said a year ago. We don't need right, we need ammo. It, he was saying this on behalf of all Ukrainians. And this uh, war is uh, very difficult to predict when it's going to be finished. We are facing a new wave of Russian aggression uh, with the idea to complete the process of Donbass occupation. Because for Putin, it would be, as he believes, one of the face saving solution to declare the end of this so-called special military operation and to keep all occupied territories under his control and to call the world to stop supporting Ukraine uh, after the achieving of this uh, goal. So uh, the mood in Ukraine this winter was difficult because uh, they started to attack um, infrastructure of electricity supply, civilian infrastructure, right. and uh, it uh, made life very difficult. At the same time, Ukrainians passed through this successfully. We, we see uh, that it was complicated, but it was very, you know, historical moment to, to stay even in Ukraine. It was historical mission, not just to fight on the front line, which is, of course, I believe one of the bravest jobs in the world during the last uh, 70 years after the end of the Second World War. But even to stay in Ukraine is difficult. I know a lot of people decided to spend at least the winter outside right. just to access to basic basic needs. And uh, Ukrainians survived. It's really important to say that all plans of the Putin were not fulfilled and were not complete. But at the same time, Ukrainians shown that we are able to fight the second most powerful army in the world. And this is the service Ukraine provided to the democracy. Because it's not just about our territorial integrity, but about values which your state also based on. 
Well, I could not agree more with that. And I think it's important for people to remember that here in the United States, that this is not just a fight between two European armies far away. It's a fight between an autocracy versus a democracy. Uh, it's a, an imperial war. You know, we thought we got rid of imperialism uh, after World War II, but now it's back. And, and then annexation, that is also something we thought we got rid of. And, and I just have to say, as an American who believes in those values, it is uh, awe-inspiring to watch what you're doing, not just for your own security, but for democracy around the world and for the, the rules-based international order that we, we seek to preserve. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, just dig in a little bit more. Is, are people in Ukraine just getting used to war? Tell us what a day-to-day -day is. The sirens go off, the electricity goes out. Does it, is it become ritualized now or is it still not? Of course, it's still complicated. At the same time, it's a very interesting phenomenon to, to, to learn, to study how people can accept new reality and uh, survive in new reality, which can be very difficult. At the same time, uh, Ukrainians eager to have our own state and uh, to stay in this country, not to travel abroad. And it means when uh, attacks against electricity infrastructure started in the middle of October, in a few weeks, uh, if you walk through Kiev, through the center, uh, you can hear the noise of generators. Right. So Ukraine is extremely self-organized to buy all generators everywhere it could be possible to do. The same as it happened during the first uh, weeks of the war when Ukrainians bought all pick-up vehicles and SUV cars everywhere in Europe to buy these cars for Ukrainian soldiers on the front line. And they're just and buying they're, them by themselves, right? It's all... Yeah, buying by themselves. I'm part of volunteer movement. We bought, I believe, more than 100 pick up and SUV cars for the front line, visiting our uh, brigade on the front line in Donbass region regularly, like twice a month. And uh, we know how extremely difficult now to find any pickup vehicle in Europe, even in UK, where they have a uh, different way to rule the, the road, you know, by right. car. Right. And uh, this huge deficit means that Ukrainians self-organized very well, the same as it happened with generators. And uh, it's national idea, of course, uh, for Ukrainians not just to survive, but to build a new Ukraine with completely different reputation and with completely different opportunities for all Ukrainians. And very important to say that president is a role model for this. So he is extremely modest. He, live, he lives in uh, officer president for one year. They wear the same, the same um, let's say, uniform or uniform, wardrobe, right. the, yes. same, the same T-shirt, the same... Um, hoodie is the same um, sweatshirt to show that he is a part of this movement. And uh, he is not an um, army man. He cannot wear army uniform, but uh, he's trying to identify himself with, he's, he's showing that he identifi identifies himself with army wearing this green t-shirts and green uh, hoodies. And it's also very important for dress code. You know, I think it will have a global impact. Even uh, it's going to be fashionable in some sense. Yeah to wear like Zelensky wears. I, I think you're right about that. I think that it's bigger than Ukraine. And I, I just have to say that the, the public communications uh, strategy of the presidential administration of which you are a part has been, I think, just fantastically successful. It's hard to, you know, there's there's three people in, in academic circles in America that Zelensky's in the circle of. It's, a, it's Churchill. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Zelensky. That's that's what how they compare him in terms of the communication skills. But let's talk a little bit more about that. Your president recently was on a trip to Europe, his first trip to Europe. Um, tell us how how you think that trip went. Uh, how do you assess European assistance so far, and what more is needed from the Europeans? And then we'll talk more about we'll talk uh, uh, secondly about the Americans. This trip was very important for Europe, first of all, to show the spirit of Ukrainians for Europeans. You know, I think uh, Europe lost a little bit themselves during the last few decades. Right. Because of internal crisis, because of uh, uh, destabilization uh, inspired by Russia, because of the fake news and propaganda, because of uh, Russian money working in uh, European politics, because of different issues. 
And now Ukraine, uh, if I can say, Ukraine provided the sense for Europe to exist united. You know, right. this is the moment for self uh, inspiration because Europe now has some example on uh, values. The European Union was founded 70 years ago, 70 plus years ago, to show that this is the same values, very important, very visible, and very valuable somewhere very next to Europe. And uh, of course, Ukraine deserves to be part of uh, European Union. At the same time, uh, these values deserve to exist in Europe again. And uh, Europe is united. US shows global leadership again. So this is very good for democracy, but also it's very important to maybe to reconsider a lot of different processes in global politics as well, like a global south. It should not be ignored because we see how Russia is skillful on global south right. to manipulate with public opinion, to lie billions of people, billions of people, how skillful propaganda can be. We can see on example what the process is going on in Russia inside of the state. Right. Also, uh, so trip to Europe was important to encourage Europeans to provide Ukraine tanks and another Amos, which is crucial to prevent new wave of Russian aggression and to uh, start a counteroffensive, which is going to happen in spring and summer. And uh, this counteroffensive would be crucial for the further development of this war. If Ukraine succeeds with counteroffensive, I believe we can finish this war this year with very successful positive result. If it's not successful, it will create a huge risk for the whole global democracy. So that is why President traveled to Europe to stand together with European leaders and to encourage them personally by his personal ex example that uh, war is not finished. When Kyiv was deoccupied, the Kyiv region was deoccupied a year ago for many people. It was the moment they believed the war is over. No, we are far away from the end of the war. Unfortunately to say it, but we need support of the West. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your your predictions or projections or discussions about the, the counteroffensive, the Russian counteroffensive. And I want you to help our listeners understand uh, what you believe to be Putin's new objectives in the war, right? It's a little bit confusing, frankly, because uh, at the beginning of the war, he, he had many grandiose ideas about denazification and uh, demilitarization, um, unifying allegedly the one Slavic nation. Uh, more recently, he talks more about Donbass, as you already said, um, but others don't. Others talk about uh, wider objectives. Help us understand what you believe first are Putin's objectives now in the war. And then second, we'll talk about uh, what you think will happen with respect to counteroffensives in the spring and summer. For Putin, it's a zero sum game. So he cannot find any compromise which would be valuable for Ukraine, you know, <laughs> because what he is proposing us is to accept occupation, uh, that we lose part of Ukraine. Right. Not only the but South, uh, Kherson and the Parisian region. And uh, for him, it's uh, just a pause for further escalation in a right. few years, maybe. And uh, for, Ukraine, for Ukrainians, it's unacceptable. For Ukrainian right. society, Ukrainian army, Ukrainian president, the officer president for everyone. And uh, now he's trying to find a solution which will save his face. As I told you, it's to occupy the Holden bus and to say that the initial goal of special military operations, he called it, is achieved and we're not going to attack any new Ukrainian territories, but keep what they occupied. And to use this argument for Europeans who are sick and tired with the war to say that uh, stop this war. Right. Don't provide Ukraine any weapons, any financial support uh, unless Ukraine uh, continues the fight. And uh, uh, if uh, Ukraine continue to try to, if Ukraine continue to try to deoccupy its territories, it means Ukraine is aggressor now in his right. uh, in his in his proposal in his uh, theory in his product for public opinion in Europe. And uh, uh, I think he will pay the highest price for this, but to complete the occupation of Donbas, 
which is very difficult because I was on Donbass 20 years since May last year. And I understand how huge is the territory of Donbass, which is not occupied as well. It's, uh, it will take not weeks, not months, but maybe years of bloody war to go forward, to complete the occupation of Donbass. That is why I don't see visible uh, solution for Putin in this war. But if, for, for what is dangerous, I think Putin considers the war not as a process, but as an idea. Right. For him, it's not uh, the result is important, but this, the, the process itself. He reestablished his state to live in this state of the war, his country right. can live in the state of the war. And he's okay with this. It's a legal way to suppress opposition, to destroy any uh, alternatives, to put his enemies in jail, to repress freedom of speech. And he's happy with this. He has right. nothing to lose. That is why I think it's a global challenge. And this global challenge as well as well to show in other countries that uh, aggression can be a simple solution for aggressor. So right. we, 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 I believe Ukraine war was to be supported because uh, it will stop in other countries to demonstrate aggression against its neighbors. Exactly right. And to let me ask just to specify uh, for our listeners, when you say Donbass, you mean the, the two regions, not the four regions that he's annexed uh, on course. paper, you, uh, but he's just focused on those two right now, right? Or is but he focused he, on all four? I, I believe he is uh, focused on Donbass, but he's not ready to uh, leave the territories occupied right. before. I mean, right. Kherson region, which is mainly occupied, and Zaporizhia region, big part of this territory, including nuclear power plant, is right. occupied by, and the nuclear power plant keeps the whole Europe as a hostage of this war because there is a six nuclear power stations in one on one station, like six Chernobyl in on one, on one station. It's a huge. It's the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, which of course cannot be part of uh, any uh, military operations or war fight at all because right. it's the price too high. The risk is too high. The risk is too high. Uh, I want to come back to the, the support from the United States in a minute, but before I do, just tell us a little bit about what it was like. I saw you in Kherson. Uh, what what did the city feel like right after it was liberated when you were there? Just give us a sense of the the mood among the people there. It's like it was like a sorry to say like a black hole. You know, people had no access to electricity, right. to water supply, to mobile connection. So they came to only few locations, including train station, which we established as a survival place to have access to Starlinks and to electricity generators for recharge the phones. Uh, but they were, they had no idea what's really going on being occupied. At the same time, what surprised me that uh, local population did not accept Russians as a uh, traitors. So, uh, if you walk through the street in Kherson, after more than nine months of occupation, even the signs of the shops, of the signs of the stores, of the restaurants were Ukrainian. So it wow. means that local small medium enterprises did not change the signs, keep, kept them in Ukrainian language because they did not uh, want to change the identification. Right. The only few locations changed the branding. It was a university. Uh, local university changed uh, into the, turned into Russian and uh, maybe a lot of billboards with a propaganda of a fake referendum, which happened in uh, fall last year. Mainly people stayed with Ukraine in their hearts and there were very touching moments when some Ukrainians on video uh, discovered the flags in the soil, you know, when they put these flags into the soil, uh, like secreted to keep them uh, uh, wow. hidden until Russia leaves the territory or territory is deoccupied. That is, that is an incredible story. That's amazing. We're close to uh, the end of our time. Let's, I want to ask you two more questions. Uh, one is about the United States. Uh, so can you give us your assessment of how the support has been so far, military, economic, sanctions, uh, humanitarian assistance, um, and then 
give me your assessment as to what more needs to be done. Starting from the first day of the war, US government is one of the strongest support of Ukraine and uh, we appreciate it. From the beginning, we consider US as our main ally and partner and no one made more for Ukraine but Americans. At the same time, of course, we have more and more, you know, to, to continue at least resistance, even not to the occupation, because Russia had a huge mobilization of local population, right. including pris prisoners from prisons, including criminals, and they had really one of the strongest army in the world. We should not uh, consider a Russian army as uh, idiots and, you know, uh, weak, uh, weak soldiers. Right. They are really strong. We should uh, we should uh, respect our enemy. Exactly. Uh, yes. It's not it's not it's not a piece of cake, and it's really a big war in Europe uh, with a score of battles like in Stalingrad, in Kursk during Second World War. Right. And uh, what is important that to fight this war, Ukraine is really eager to have American support, and um, unfortunately, we get what we need uh, later on, like in three four months period. So if we get uh, artillery before war started, I think Russia would not have a progress on the front line after right. the invasion started. If we got uh, anti-aircraft systems like Patriots in summer, Russia did not destroy our electricity infrastructure and uh, millions of Ukrainians did not leave Ukraine during the winter time. If we got uh, tanks in autumn, I believe we we could have now very good counter offensive operation on the front line during winter time, but uh, it's always you know like three four months later than we expected it happened. That is why, uh, with all appreciation, we still very much looking forward to get weapons we are looking for, and uh, the same will happen with the jets. I believe the Ukraine will get them, but again with delay, which is crucial because in the wartime one of the main sources is not only ammunition or soldiers, but time. We, right. By losing time, we're losing territories, losing lives, losing our uh, reserves of ammo. I believe for Americans, this war is also very important because it shows the values which your state was founded on, still very much respected in Europe, in a country which is far away from America, but at the same time, very close by spirit. And the um, Russians understand it and Russia propaganda started to spin one of the topics that this war is for uh, American financial circles, for industries creating and producing weapons for American uh, political establishment and so on and so forth. So typical bullshit from the Cold War time. It means that uh, by using this argument, Russia shows that this war is really important for democracy in the sense that um, this is the future of not only Ukrainian democracy, but the global democracy is uh, on the table. That is why we consider your support as really crucial for us. And uh, that is why presidential trip to US was so important. I believe uh, it was the moment for, it was historical moment for sure. At the same time, maybe it would be difficult for Ukraine to get all necessary support as much as it was before because you have some changes in your internal politics. It's up to America to decide who's going to rule your country and represent um, um, voters in Congress. Uh, but uh, we see that um, some changes happened and uh, we would appreciate if uh, new Congress will stay, stand on Ukraine as, did, as it was done by previous one. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on, um, uh, uh, both so we understand the security interests, but also the values that we share. Uh, I most certainly agree with that, and I think it's important for Americans to remember, uh, after all, that's that was the how our country was created. So thank you, Sergei, for reminding us of our own history. Uh, thank you for joining uh, I, us here. I, I, I had no idea to use this argument with kind of pretext, but only to show that we have we stand on the same on the same basis. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, Slava Ukraina. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate your role and your role of American citizens, American government.
Well, and let's hope we can get you back on. Let's just do this more frequently. I think it'd be great for our listeners to hear more often from you. And we'll do that in the, in the coming months. It was all my pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Okay. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Smogley Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a review and be sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.